I'm used to the chaos and I'm used to, um, I don't know, having it all go to shit and then figuring it out after, so. So you're saying that making a big studio movie is a lot like growing up in a Chinese restaurant. I'm Kamel Nanjiani. I'm a comedian, writer, actor, producer uh, person. I'm Lulu Wong. I am a writer and director. I'm John M. Chu. Uh, I'm a director and professional body trainer for my little three-year-old. Hey guys, I'm Ali Maki. Uh, I'm an actress and also the founder of Asian American Girl Club. Hey, I'm Asa Minhaj. I'm a comedian and uh, we have to do potty training very soon. I'm Audrey Yap, news anchor and reporter for Variety. And welcome to Hashtag Represent Success Stories, our roundtable in honor of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. All right, so I wanted to center this conversation because it is Heritage Month, but also I wanted it to be around the theme of success what that has meant to you in your careers, what that has looked like to you, but also some of the differing and sometimes conflicting definitions of that, especially among AAPIs. So my first question is, when did you first feel successful in your career? Well, for me, I know my first big splurge, I bought a laundry machine, a washer dryer. It was great uh, because I'd never had that before. The only issue is what I thought was success at the time, because I was uh, I was straight out of college. I was 22 years old. Um, I got attached pay or play to a, a musical Bye Bye Birdie at Sony. And so I was like, all right, I made it. I'm going to splurge on this thing. And five years later, I still hadn't made my first movie. So what I thought uh, was success, I hadn't quite done that yet. So Hollywood <laughs> can trick you in those ways where you believe you've made it and you haven't quite yet. And eventually when I did direct my first movie, Step Out to the Streets, I got myself a mattress. I thought it was a mattress? I, that's all I got was a mattress. And it, had a, and, and it was very uneven. What about you, Kamel? When's the first time you felt successful? Um, you know, I it's, it's hard because I still don't really feel, I really don't feel successful because I think as John was saying, Hollywood, in Hollywood, success is not permanent, right? You're only as good as like the last thing. So I still feel that pressure all the time. Like soon as you do, especially right now, as soon as you make something, people are like, all right, what's next? What's the next thing you're going to do? I feel like as soon as you yeah. do something, it disappears immediately. So there's, there's, you really cannot be comfortable at all. So it's kind of job to job, this, this business. But I will say I felt a little more successful when I started reading parts or auditioning for parts that were not like stereotypical brown guy parts, which I know my first few years of auditioning, it's all I saw were, were very, very stereotypical parts. And so, so when I started sort of getting opportunities that were outside of that, that felt good. What kinds of parts were you reading for? So there's a really, really big movie actually that I auditioned for and uh, I was a taxi driver uh, and the guy was like, the director was like, hey, could you like play up the accent a little bit? And I was like, I'm sorry, I won't. And then the guy felt really bad. He felt really embarrassed. Um, and I was like, no, it's fine. I'm just not going to do it. If that's what you want, I'm not, I'm not your guy. Um, and then that movie was hugely successful. Uh, <laughs> no, don't regret it. <laughs> the ladies, can you weigh in? When have you, when was the first time you felt successful? Well, I felt a little bit successful today because I got a message from someone that said, an old friend who said, hey, you're in the crossword puzzle today. But I think for me, fundamentally, when I, similar to Kumail, uh, my, the first time I actually felt successful was on a project where they sent me the script to do it. And I said, I, I you know, I love the book. I love this project but the scripts are just not there. And so I have to pass unless I can, you know, really redo the script. And they said, yeah, you know, you can do your version. And I said, no, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to fix something that has already been built, you know, like I need to build it from the ground up. And, um, and so thank you, but no, thank you. And then they came back and said, we'll start over. Like we've been developing for a year, but we want you to do it so you can just take the property and, you know, we'll, we'll just start from scratch because in the past, I've always been pretty much like take, you know, ha having to debate like, do I just take this job because I need the money and you, you're always having to be grateful. And it was the first time where I actually could say no. And then the studio came around and gave me everything that I needed to 
yeah what would be my best work i think um probably the first time was when i was you know starting to be able to pay my bills through comedy like i was able to quit you know working a full-time day job per se and then shift over to comedy and then the first time i i really felt like maybe i can do this as a career um was probably when i was hired at the daily show for more we're joined by senior religious correspondent hassan minaj hassan thank you for joining us the daily show being this you know loved and revered new york institution and getting that co-sign from john he made a lot of things really easy for me i was able to get past the comedy seller and, and, and just get through all these hurdles that i didn't think would be possible and it, and it just opened up my career so, Can I, I say when I knew you were successful, Hassan, was when I saw you in the NBA All-Star Game. Hassan Minaj. Oh, Hassan! The foul. I'll be honest, I got a little upset. I was very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you, you play? No, I, do. I play video games. I don't play. Oh. But you were good. <laughs> I had such a chip on my shoulder. It actually, actually, Camille, you're actually right, man. Like, that meant so much to me. Having tearaways that you can tear away, being able to tech into the game. Yeah. <laughs> no, I saw the eye of the tiger. You were like, oh, you were in it to win it. Yeah, everybody, everybody was like, you really want this. And I was like, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah man, it was you and Quavo out there. Yeah, yeah. So, Ali, when did you first feel successful? Um, yeah, I think it's uh, when I ended up booking the show Wrecked that I was on for a few years. I don't have my dry shampoo. I will light these pirates on fire, okay? Okay, okay baby. You know, usually with. Asian roles, you go all the way to the bottom. And so this role was kind of closer to the top of the breakdown. So I was like, there's no way they're gonna go for this. Booking that like kind of busted my whole world wide open of if, if I could play this role, you know, what other kinds of roles could I play? And, you know, I kind of grown up in the industry. I moved here when I was 14. So, you know, that whole, my whole life was basically like, you're either have an accent or you're this like over-sexualized ninja chick. And there wasn't really an in-between. So when those roles started becoming more and more that I could be this like all-American girl, I could just be a girl, um, that was, yeah, that felt very successful for me. It sounds like then success is kind of uh, tied to the ability to say no. Yeah, it's sort of a catch-22. I have a lot of friends who are indie filmmakers who are going through this where they can't say no. They're being offered these choices. None of those choices may be provide the platform for them to have full creative control. But at some point you also say, you know, I have to get going. I have to make my first feature. I have to make, just make something. I said a yes to a lot of movies, a lot of sequels, my first seven, eight movies, uh, studio movies. I felt very lucky to be there. I felt very like, oh, they want to hire me, I'm in and I'll figure it out. I knew how to make a movie, but I wasn't like an artist yet. I'd spent years and years to learn how to, I guess, say no, but but mostly to feel confident that I didn't, I wasn't lucky to be here anymore, that I actually earned the right to be here. And that I actually, I remember the time when after Now You See Me Too, which I loved and worked with some of the best actors, but I definitely felt like creatively uh, sort of stuck for myself. And I remember putting everything aside and say, I don't want to say, I don't want to read anything. I got to figure out for myself what I want to do. And I want to do something that scares me. Uh, and that's how we found Crazy Rich Asians and In the Heights, which I which I signed on at the same time, actually. The world spins around while I'm frozen to my seat. When you're doing a big studio movie like that, what is the, what is the pressure you face? Like, what is that like? Mm -hmm. I'm doing B.I. Joe. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of pressures. Well, G.I. Joe is very particular because you have a toy company that is making, you know, millions and millions of dollars off of toys. So yeah. you got to respect that. And that's a history. Then you've got the original makers of G.I. Joe who have a very specific idea. There's the ninja side and there's like the military side. And then you have The Rock and you have Bruce Willis who all are like clashing like this. So uh, not, in, not in a personal way, but like, you know, they all have ideas. And then my parents, are like, when's the movie coming out? When are you gonna? When is it gonna be in theaters? When are you gonna be in World Journal? Because they don't think anything's real until it's in the Chinese newspaper. I basically was like, I don't know. I don't. This is a lot, and I don't know how you actually deal with it. Other than I had to just ignore it and just make a movie. But I think I'm used to it. I'm I'm one of five kids, so I'm and I grew up in a restaurant, a crazy Chinese restaurant. So I'm used to the chaos, and I'm used to um, I don't know having it all go to 
shit and then figuring it out after so so you're saying that making a big studio movie is a lot like growing up in a chinese restaurant it is exactly it's a, basically a pirate ship that you've got to get to the next place and whatever it takes after doing all these movies that you know the justin bieber documentary which was also chaos and i love find, it by the way i love oh, that documentary thank you. thank you you find you find that no matter what happens it's your confidence grows that you will figure it out.